Listen now to a reading from the Old Testament, the book of Esther, which is a book that we in the Christian community have pretty much left to our Jewish brothers and sisters. It's not often read or preached from in Christian congregations, but it's a good story. So many, as many twists and turns as a soap opera in Esther. I'll talk about that some later in the sermon. But here, this, I'm going to read you one of the high moments of the story when Queen Esther advocates at considerable risk to herself on behalf of her people. From the seventh chapter, hear this word. So the king and Haman went into the feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, if it please the king, let my life be given me to my, at my petition and my people at my request, for we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he? that would presume to do this. And Esther said, A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was in terror before the king and the queen. Then said Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, Moreover, the gallows which Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing in Haman's house fifty cubits high. So the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the anger of the king was abated. And Mordecai recorded these things, sent letters to all the Jews who were in the provinces of King Ahas Ahasuerus, both far and near, enjoining them that they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar and the 15th day of the same year by year as days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month that has been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness and days for sending choice portions to one another and gifts to the poor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that we might be the masters of ourselves to become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for thee. Amen. It has become my habit over the years to start off the fall church program year with a sermon series. And this year will be no exception. For these four weeks of September, I want to do a series, uh, this time under an overarching theme that I'm calling Confident Living in Difficult Times. And essentially, let me just be upfront about it and say there are a couple things behind the series. First is the simple truth that while I think almost all of us in our better moments recognize that life is a gift, life is to be cherished, and life is wonderful, it's also true that life is an imperfect gift. Uh, it is difficult. Nobody lives under ideal circumstances, and in every life, there are both things that we celebrate and things that we are stuck with. One of my predecessors in this pulpit some years ago made it, uh, famously said uh, repeatedly, there's a broken heart in every pew. And a good way to say that. The, the reality is that there are heartbreaks and difficulties. No matter how good we understand life to be, there are headwinds that come to us all. And that means, I want to say, that courage will always be a primary Christian virtue. Courage is a primary Christian virtue because it's the first value that you have to have 
to be able to engage all the other Christian values. I mean, when you think about it, all the values that we hold dear in Christianity, things like compassion and selflessness and, you know, thinking of others before we think of ourselves and being able to give of ourselves, all of those values that are part and parcel of following Jesus, you've got to have courage to live that way. You got, that's the first step in getting there. And so the next four weeks some thoughts on what makes for a courageous and principled life when the headwinds come and the heartbreaks come and the road gets rough. And today, the the central point I want to say right up front is that it, um, it can help stay on course in life just to realize that every day uh, we start from where we are. You know, we, our, our, our faith journey begins from our current circumstance and not some circumstance we wish we had. Uh, Life may treat all of us roughly on any given day, but there is some sense of freedom, I think, in acknowledging that we can be true to our best selves, to the, the, the processes of growth and the principles that we value, even if we can't control the outcome of how that's going to play out on any given day, because life's imperfect as it is. Uh, it's a very biblical concept, I would suggest. Do you remember that story in the Gospels where Jesus is giving instructions to the disciples? He's just about to turn them loose for the very first time to go out on their own and be missionaries into the world. And he gathers 70 of the best ones together. That He has handpicked and trained himself. So you can't have any better qualification than that. Personally trained by Jesus, hand-selected for the mission, and um, he's turning them loose to go into the world. And do you remember the instructions he gives? Go into the towns, be gracious, tell them the kingdom of God is coming near to you, eat whatever is set before you, say to every house, peace be with you. He starts to give all these instructions, and then he says this, oh, by the way, Sometimes this isn't going to work. Sometimes you're going to be gracious and you're going to be kind and you're going to say, the kingdom of God is coming near. The peace of God be with you. Thank you for this lovely, simple meal that you have given. And they will slam the door right in your face. And when that happens, do you remember? Shake the dust off your feet and go on. That's a remarkable instruction, I think, and kind of freeing, even for people who were personally picked, personally prepared by Jesus himself. He says, be true to your principles, but get ready for a headwind. It's going to come. And in those moments, the only thing you can do is just acknowledge it, shake yourself off, pick yourself up, and go on, saying, I'm not going to do this again if people are going to be mean to me, will not help. Whining won't help. Wishing everybody was nicer won't help. The strength that you need, Jesus clearly implies in that instruction, isn't the strength of callousness or being oblivious or unfeeling uh, about your hurt. It's acknowledging that your hurt is there but staying true to your principles anyway. I mean, I think that's really a fairly accurate assessment of what's going on. Stay true to your principles Don't worry about the outcome. Just worry about doing your part and uh, and trust in the goodness that will come from that. And it's interesting, um, I was thinking about all of this when I came across just this past week a really thoughtful op-ed piece published in the New York Times by, uh, by David Brooks that sounded really a lot like this. I don't know if you saw it this week or not. It was, uh, David Brooks wrote a piece in the op-ed uh, section of the New York Times, Making Modern Toughness. I would, I would commend it to you. It's worth reading for yourself, but, but I'll tell you the gist of it. I mean, that's what, you, that's what I'm paid to do, uh, so let me do it. Um, uh, Brooks says in that piece that the world would be a better place if we could somehow redefine what real toughness means in human life. He says, nowadays, toughness is a word that's pretty much become synonymous with callousness, developing a thick skin, walling off your emotions when you're under assault in some way or other. Tough people, Brooks says, are people who have developed an emotional shell 
and, and, and they naturally see things first and foremost from a kind of a defensive posture. What's the next threat that might be heading my way, and how do I get ready for that? Toughness is equated, Brooks says, with callousness. But he goes on to ask a good question. Wouldn't the world be a better place if we began to think of toughness in a different way? What if being tough was deeper than just having an emotional callous or an armor that surrounded you so that nothing hurt you? Here's how he says it. Uh, The people we admire for being resilient are not hard or callous. No, they are ardent. They are ardent. They are tough and determined because they have a fervent commitment to some cause, some ideal, some relationship, and that higher yearning enables them to withstand setbacks and pain and betrayal. And he goes on in the article to talk about tough people that he admires. Congressman John Lewis of the civil rights days, you know, he's a congressman now, but uh, of civil rights fame is where he, he kind of cut his teeth in, in the public eye. Uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, the great social activist, Brooks says, they might not have been intrinsically tough, but they were profoundly tough in the name of causes that they found worth living and dying for. Civil rights, in Lewis' case, or Mother Teresa's care steadfastly for the poor in the name of God. So Brooks's point is that people are really tough only after we have taken a leap of faith for some truth or some mission or some love uh, that we want to give ourselves wholeheartedly to. And when we do that, he says, then you can withstand a whole lot. You know, we, we live in an age when it's considered sophisticated to be disenchanted or a little c- cynical when it comes to people who give themselves for principles. But uh, the people who are enchanted rather than disenchanted, those are the ones, he says, who are the real tough cookies when it comes to living your life. I like the piece very much. Toughness as an outgrowth of living for a larger good, a larger cause, it strikes me, that's a recurring theme in the Bible over and over again, and it's the central point of the book of Esther. Esther's not a particularly well-known story for Chris, Christians, and it wouldn't surprise me uh, if, if many of you say this is the first time you've heard much of the, the story. Uh, Esther, you know, almost didn't make inclusion in the Bible. Our church fathers, they assembled in the third century to decide what books are going to be included of the 66 and which one's not. There was a pretty sizable contingent that said, we don't want Esther. It's too complicated. And do you know, this is a a trivia pursuit question, Uh, Esther is the only book in the Bible where God is not mentioned. Not once. Never brought up. And for that reason, some of the fathers said, not deserving of being in the canon. Um, but anyway, you know, which is interesting, it, it, the fact that it was included, I think, just goes to show you that uh, just because you don't mention the name of God doesn't mean God doesn't show up anyway. You know, there's the other side to that. But, but in a nutshell, let me just quickly tell you the story, just kind of the Cliff Notes version. The, the story was written when the Persians ruled most of the world as we know it. The, nowadays, nowadays, Persia is Iran. The Persians were in charge, clear from Egypt to India. And what happened, in a nutshell, was that uh, the queen angered the king of Persia one day. She refused one of his orders, which was something that you didn't do in patriarchal uh, antiquity, and she was summarily deposed, and the king began a search for a new, more obedient first lady. And when news of that got out, this kind of mad scramble took place, kind of a Cinderella story, if you like, of all families who had an eligible daughter uh, bringing bringing their fairest maid uh, in front of the king, who was now the eligible richest man in the world, most eligible bachelor, for a kind of a beauty contest of who would be chosen. And uh, um, among among them was a young woman who, according to the story, decides to skip all the beauty treatments that the rivals were going through and just be herself, which apparently was enough to catch the king's eye, and she was chosen. She went by Esther, which is the Persian word for star, but that was a fake name. Her real name, her birth name, uh, was Hadassah. The the new queen of Persia, this lovely woman, uh, was, unbeknownst to the king, a Jew. 
And all of that's pretty much the background, uh, and what comes next has a whole lot of twists and turns to it, but in a nutshell, here's what it is. Uh, Jews, remember, and Esther is a Jew, uh, they found themselves throughout biblical times occupied and controlled by a whole bunch of different uh, 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 foreign powers. Uh, the Assyrians had them for a while. Of course, the Egyptians had them. Uh, now the Persians have them. And one of the things that all of the occupying armies discovered, Romans uh, had their turn as well, is that um, Jews were not an easy people to occupy. Uh, the foreign leaders who tried to subjugate Jews found them to be enormously stubborn in giving any loyalty to the king. Uh, they, they had this innate loyalty to Yahweh, and they were always resistant to any kind of allegiance giving to any secular king who happened to be in charge at the moment. Uh, and that trait, uh, their, their loyalty to God, plays out in the story of Esther like this. One of Esther's relatives, a man named Mordecai, got crossways with the king's most trusted prince, a man named Haman, because Mordecai refused to bow to Haman one day when they met on the sidewalk. And Haman, who is a, a, a petty person in the story, uh, a person with a chip on his shoulder, didn't take the snub lightly. Uh, he contrived a plan to do away not just with Mordecai, but all these resistant Jews who would not bow to the, the powers that be. Uh, Haman's plan uh, was to trick the king into signing an order for the wholesale slaughter of the entire Jewish population, kind of smuggle it into some documents that the king was to sign, and thinking he would just sign this, I'll have this execution order for all the Jews set to take place on the 13th day of the 12th month. And so just as Esther is becoming queen, the time for the destruction of the Jewish... He gets the, he gets the signature, by the way, so the, 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 the wheels are put in motion for this execution. And um, Esther's just now coming to the throne, and um, this is the point in the story when, with things falling apart, Esther decides she has to step up and do this principled, tough, courageous, but very dangerous thing she decides she's the only one who can plead for the Jews for, before her new husband, the king. And that was the ultimate risk for her. For a woman to show up in the king's presence, even his wife, without an invitation, would never happen in that patriarchal culture. At that time, it would be considered the ultimate in arrogance for a woman to presume to come into the king's presence and tell him what he should do. And any reader of the, the story back then would know that for Esther, this, she's like hanging by a thread here uh, to, to get the king's wrath. And remember, she doesn't have to do this. She's safe. The easy thing, the expedient thing for her to do would be just to minimize the reality or ignore this impending slaughter, stay quiet, protect herself, mind her own little circle of friends, and say, this is somebody else's business. That would have been the thing. But of course, like Mother Teresa and John Lewis, she is, is driven by principle. You know, she can't turn away from the hard reality that's fallen into her lap. She can't pretend it's not there. And in the most famous words from the book, her brother Mordecai, reinforcing her courage and her principle and her keeping faith with the best impulse within her, uh, says at one point, who knows, perhaps, perhaps you have come into royal dignity for just such a time as this. Perhaps this is your purpose in life. This is your central principle, your guiding light that you can give yourself to. Well, she follows through, and the king hears her out, and uh, much to everyone's surprise, not only is he not mad, but uh, uh, he stays up all night after she, her first approach and wonders what to do next. The story is he has insomnia, and while he's up late killing time, he reviews the chronicles of the court, and he comes across an entry in the daily palace record that Mordecai, Esther's family member, has actually been a very loyal subject. He's gone out of his way at one point to foil a palace coup uh, the king didn't even know about, and he was never rewarded for his loyalty. And, and the text that I read you this morning comes in right at this place, the details of the kind of turning of the tables. As Esther's brother Mordecai is now elevated, and Haman, the, the one who wanted to execute all the innocents in this kind of underhanded ploy, he is brought low. He's exposed, 
And uh, so in this bitter irony, uh, Haman is hanged on the very gallows that he had prepared uh, to, to kill Mordecai on. And to this day, to this day, the Jewish tradition celebrates the 12th month, the 13th day, as a feast, the Feast of Purim. Uh, one woman's courageous and principled stand on behalf of others who are vulnerable at great risk to herself. That's the, that's the celebration of that. We, we celebrate people who stand on principle, even if it's potentially very costly to them, for the sake of others. And that's the central theme every year. Uh, and the book of Esther makes that point. Whether God's name is mentioned out loud or not, and in Esther's case, it was not mentioned, but mentioned or not, God is behind the scenes at work when principle and when our best impulses are followed. God carves a way forward when it looks like there will be no way, using often the courage of one person to save many. And, and the capacity to follow Esther's example and to live with principle like that, Brooks says that's the key to toughness in, in the headwinds of your life. I like that. And, and, and it's, it's not callousness so much as it is faithfulness, isn't it? I mean, th that capacity that's somewhere inside all of us. And the other thing that I would say, uh, Brooks doesn't say this, but I would say it, is that uh, one of the great uh, pieces of good news in this world is that even the most humble people can stand for the greatest of principles. Even the simplest, most humble life can come to stand for the greatest of things uh, and have the noblest of uh, values express them. Uh, I saw in the Associated Press News just this past week the story of a woman named Freya David. I don't know if you saw this or not. Freya David, and Freya is the perfect first name for this woman. Uh, she lives in Needham, Massachusetts. Uh, Freya is her perfect name because for the last 32 years, she has worked at the Fry Station for a McDonald's, a McDonald's restaurant in Needham, Massachusetts. 32 years at the Fry Station. And she, Freya, has been a loyal, loyal worker at that restaurant. And among the circumstances of her life is the fact that she has Down syndrome. Uh, she was given a chance to go to work back in the 1980s. And uh, despite those limitations uh, from her condition, uh, she never missed a shift from 1984 to this week. Never once missed a shift. Over the years, she came to know all of the regulars uh, by name, and she has been known spontaneously to break out in a dance at the fryer when the timer rings and those fries are ready to dump. Anyway, she retired this week in Needham, and according to the Associated Press, 160 of her favorite customers showed up. Uh, she was given a silver necklace that they had custom made with a little McDonald's french fry box uh, as the pendant and they presented her with a proclamation of appreciation from the Massachusetts State Legislature, both houses of the uh, state legislature. Uh, the the Cong local uh, representative who presented it said it was one of the few things they had unanimous consent on the entire year. <laughs> but this notice of appreciation for her presence and her supportive presence in the community, there she is. Uh, and in the AP interview, what I love most is that she said this, Friar's comment, I just love doing this work with these people. I know when I just pay attention to what I can do rather than worry about what I can't do, life is fun. So I enjoy what I do have rather than be sad about what I don't. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Um, maybe today, Maybe today God is saying to you something like that. Uh, can you be happy with what you have? Can you celebrate what you can do rather than what you can't? Uh, certainly it comes to all of us, that voice. And, and God may be calling to you and to me this week to do something tough and to remember that happiness really is an, an internal generated thing. It's an inside job, uh, and it comes from responding positively to the call to be a bigger person, to live for a larger cause, and to make the contribution that you can make, not worrying so much about how the outcome's going to unfold, leaving that to God. If you're hearing that voice today, then Freya's story and Esther's story, too, may be one of the more important stories you've heard for a while. Amen.